guys. Hope you're all doing well. Today is a big day. We're starting the next chapter. Um, I used to try to hide it, but it's too late. I'm reading the, <laughs> the Stephen King uh, series. Hopefully he does it well. And I doubt he does, but yeah, this is part two. Pretty big book. Like 450 pages. So yeah, I'm excited to finally get into it. Mm. Alright, so this is just like a description, I guess. Uh, just a foreword. Prologue. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll probably go to chapter three. <clears throat> All right. So, yeah, sorry in advance. My, I, I don't know. My nose is blocked. The argument. The argument. Drawing of the Three is a second volume of a long tale, yeah, called The Dark Tower. A tale inspired by, and to some degree dependent upon, Robert Browning's narrative poem Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. Which is its turn, which in its turn owes a debt to King Lear. The first volume, The Gunslinger, tells how Roland, the last gunslinger of the world, which has moved on, finally catches up with the man in black, the sorcerer. He has chased for a very long time. <clears throat> so, yeah, this is perfect because they'll just kind of recap the first book. I read it in many videos, so if you want to go through the whole first book, just go back in my videos, and if you go back to the first one and go up from there, it'll be chronological, but I don't. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, catches up with the man in black, the sorcerer. He's chased for a very long time, just how long we don't yet know. The man in black turns out to be a fellow named Walter, who falsely claimed friendship of Roland's father in those days before the world moved on. Roland's goal is not this half-human creature, but the Dark Tower, the man in black, and more specifically what the man in black knows, is his first step on his road to that mysterious place. Who exactly is Roland? What was his world like before it moved on? What is the tower? Why does he pursue it? We have only fragmentary answers. Roland is a gunslinger, a kind of knight, one of those charged with holding a world, with holding a world. Roland remembers as being filled with love and light as it is to keep it from moving on. We know that Roland was forced to early uh, was forced to an early trial of manhood after discovering that his mother had become the mistress of Martin, much greater sorcerer than Walter, who unknown to Roland's father is Martin's ally. We know Martin has planned Roland's discovery, expecting Roland to fail and to be sent west. We know that Roland triumphs in this test. What else do we know? <clears throat> Gunslinger's world is not completely unlike our own. Artifacts such as gasoline pumps and certain songs like Hey Jude, for instance, or or the bit of or the bit of 
Doggard that begins beans beans the musical fruit have survived so have customs and rituals oddly like those from our own romanticized view of the american west there's an um, umbilicus which somehow connects our world to the world of the gunslinger at a way station on a long deserted uh, coach road in a great sterile desert roland meets a boy named jake who died in our world a boy who was in fact pushed from a secret corner by the ubiquitous and iniquitous man in black the last thing jake who was on his way to school with his book bags in one hand and his lunchbox in the other remembers of his world our world is being crushed beneath the heat the wheels of a cadillac and then dying before reaching the man in black jake dies again this time because of the gunslinger, faced with the second most agonizing choice of his life, he elects to sacrifice this symbolic son. Given a choice between a tower and the child, possibly between damnation and salvation, Roland chooses the tower. It's a pretty good recap. Go then, Jake tells him before plunging into the abyss. There are other worlds than these. The final confrontation between Roland and Walter occurs in a dusty Golgotha of decaying bones. The dark man tells Roland's future with a deck of tarot cards. These cards showering, showing a man called the prisoner, a woman called the Lady of Shadows, and a darker shape that is simply death, but not for you, gunslinger, the man in black tells him. Our our prophecies which become the subject of this volume okay and roland's second step on the long and difficult path to the dark tower gunslinger ends with roland sitting up upon the beach of the western sea watching the sunset the man in black is dead gunslinger's own future course unclear the drawing of the three begins on that same beach less than seven hours later Okay, because it wasn't clear that the guy was dead. All right, prologue, the sailor. Yeah. So the gunslinger came awake from a confused dream, dream, which seemed to consist of a single image, that of the sailor in the terror deck from which the man in black had dealt, or purpured, purported to deal, the gunslinger's own moaning future. He drowns, gunslinger, the man in black was saying, and no one throws out the line, the boy Jake. But this was no nightmare, it was a good dream. It was good because he was the one drowning, and that meant he was not rolling at all, but Jake. He found this a relief because it would be far better to drown as Jake than to live as himself, a man who had, for a cold, for a cold dream, betrayed a child who had trusted him. Good, all right, I'll drown, he thought, listening to the roar of the sea. Let me drown, but this was not the sound of the open deeps. It was a grating sound of water with a throat full of stones. Was he the sailor? If so, why was land so close? And in fact, was he not on the land? It felt as if freezing cold water doused his boots and ran up his legs to his crotch. His eyes flew open, and then what snapped him out of, his, of the dream wasn't his freezing balls, which had suddenly shrunk to what felt like the size of walnuts, nor even the horror to his right, but the thought of his guns, his guns, and even more important, his shells. Wet guns could be quickly disassembled, wiped dry, oiled, wiped dry again, oiled again, and reassembled. Wet shells, like wet matches, might or might not ever be usable again. The horror was a crawling thing which must have been cast up by a previous wave. It dragged a wet, gleaming body laboriously along the sand. It was about four feet long and about four yards to the right. It regarded Roland with bleak eyes on, on stalks. Its long, serrated beak 
dropped open and began to make a noise that was weirdly like human speech, plaintive, even desperate questions in an alien tongue. Did a chick, dumb a chum, dada cham, dada cheek. The young singer had seen lobsters. This wasn't one, although lobsters were the only thing he had ever seen which would, which this creature even vaguely resembled. It didn't seem afraid of him at all. Gunslinger didn't know if it was dangerous or not. Didn't care about his own mental confusion, his temporary inability to remember where he was or how he had gone there, if he had actually caught the man in black, or if all that only had been a dream. He only knew he had to get away from the water before it could drown his shells. He heard grinding, swelling roar of water and looked from the looked from the creature and looked from the creature. It had stopped and was holding up claws, which it had been pulling itself along, looking absurdly like a boxer assuming his opening stance, which court had taught them was called the honor stance, to the incoming breaker, which it's curdled of foam, with it with its curdle of foam. It hears the wave, the gunslinger thought. Whatever it is, it's got ears. He tried to get up, but his legs too numb to feel buckled under him. <clears throat> I'm dreaming, he thought. But even in his current confused state, this was a belief much too tempting to really be believed. He tried to get up again, almost made it, then fell back. The wave was breaking. There was no time again. He had to settle for moving in much the same way the creature on his right seemed to move. He dug in with both hands and dragged his butt up the stony shingle away from the wave. He didn't progress enough to avoid the wave entirely, but he got far enough for his purposes. The wave buried nothing but his boots it reached almost to his knees and then retreated. Perhaps the first one didn't go as far as I thought, perhaps. There was a half moon in the sky. A call of mist covered it, but it shed enough light for him to see. The holsters were too dark. The guns at least had suffered a wetting. It was impossible to tell how bad it had been, or if either the shells currently in the cylinders or those in the cross gun belts had also wetted. Before checking, he had to get away from the water. Had to dot a chalk. This was much closer. In his worry over the water he had gotten, in his worry over the water he had forgotten the creature the water had cast up. He looked around and saw it was now only four feet away. Its claws were buried in stone and shell littered sand of shingle. Were buried in the stone and shell littered sand of shingle. Pulling its body along, it lifted its meaty, serrated body, making it momentarily resemble a scorpion. But Roland could see no stinger at the end of its body. Another grinding roar, this one much louder. The creature immediately stopped, raised its claws and into its own peculiar version of the honor stance again. This wave was bigger. Roland began to drag himself up the slope of the, st of the strand again. When he put out his hands, the claw creature moved with the speed of which, it pre in of which its previous movements had not even hinted. The gunslinger felt a, a bright flare of pain in his right hand, but there was no time to think about that now. now. He pushed with the heels of his soggy boots, clawed with his hands, and managed to get away from the wave. Did a chick, the monstrosity, inquired in its plaintive, Won't you help me? Can't you see I'm desperate voice? And Roland saw the stumps of the first and second fingers of his right hand disappearing into the creature's jawed beak, jagged beak. It lunged again, and Roland lifted his dripping right hand just in time to save his remaining two fingers. Dumb a chum, dad a chum. The gunslinger staggered to his feet. The thing tore open his gripping jeans, tore through a boot whose old leather was soft, 
but as tough as iron, and took a chunk of meat from Roland's lower calf. He drew with his right hand, realized two of the fingers needed to perform this ancient killing operation were gone only when the revolver thumped to the sand. Wow. The monstrosity snapped at it greedily. No, bastard. Roland snarled and kicked it. It was like kicking a block of rock, one that bit. It tore away at the end of Roland's right boot, tore away most of his great toe, tore the boot itself from his foot. The gunslinger bent, picked up his revolver, dropped it, cursed, finally managed, and finally managed. What had once been a thing so easy, it didn't even bear thinking about how it had suddenly become a trick akin to juggling. The creature was crouched on the gunslinger's boot, tearing at it as it asked its garbled questions. A wave rolled toward the beach, the foam which curdled its top, looking pallid and dead in the netted light of the half moon. The lobstrosity stopped working on the boot and raised its claws in that box repose. Roland drew with his left hand, pulled the trigger three times, click, click, click. Now he knew about the shells in the chambers, at least. He holstered the left gun, holstered the right, and he had, to, he had to turn its barrel downwards with his left hand and let it drop into place. Blood slimed, slimed the worn iron wood hand grips, blood, blood spotted the holster and the old jeans to which the holster was thong tied. It poured from the stumps where his fingers used to be. His mangled right foot was still too numb to hurt, but his right hand was a bellowing fire. The ghosts of talented and long-trained fingers, which were already decomposing in the digestive juices of that thing's gut, screamed that they were still there, that they were burning. I see serious problems ahead, the customer thought remotely. Jeez. The wave retreated. The monstrosity lowered its claws, tore a, flat, a fresh hole in the gunslinger's boots, and then decided the wearer had been a good deal more tasty than this bit of skin it had somehow slot off. Without a chum, the ask scurried toward him with ghastly speed. The gunslinger retreated on legs he could barely feel, realizing that the creature must have some intelligence. It had approached him cautiously, perhaps, from a long way down the strand, not sure what he was or what he might be capable. If the dowsing wave hadn't wake wakened him, the thing would have torn off his face while he was still deep in his dream. Now, it had decided he was not only tasty but vulnerable, easy prey. It was almost upon him, a thing four feet long and a foot high. <clears throat> wow. A creature which might weigh as much as 70 pounds and which was a single mindedly carnivor which was as single mindedly as carnivorous as David. The hawk he had had a, as a boy, okay. But without David's dim vestige of loyalty. Gunslinger left Boothiel struck a rock jutting from the sand and he tottered on the edge of falling. Tottered or teetered? Dadachok, the thing asked solicitously, it seemed, and peered at the gunslinger from its st stocky, waving eyes as its claws reached. And then a wave came. The claws went up again in the horror honor stance. And now they wavered the slightest bit. The gunslinger realized that it responded to the sound of the wave, and now the sound was, for it at least, fading in it. He stepped backward over the rock, then bent down as the wave broke upon the shingle with its grinding roar. His head was inches from the insectile face of the creature. 
One of his claws might easily have slashed the ice from, from his face, but his trembling claws, so like clenched fists, remained raised to either side of its parrot-like beak. The gunslinger reached for the stone over which he had nearly fallen. It was large, half buried in the sand, and his mutilated right hand howled as bits of dirt and sharp edges of the pebble ground into the open, bleeding flesh. But he yanked the rock free, raised it, his lips pulled away from his teeth. Dada, the monstrosity began, its claws lowering and opening as the wave broke, and its, round, its sound receded, and the gunslinger swept the rock down upon it with all his strength. There was a crunching noise as the creature's segmented back broke. It lashed wildly beneath the rock, its rear half lifting and thudding, lifting and thudding. Its interrogatives became, became buzzing exclamations of pain. Its claws opened and shut upon nothing. Its maw of a beak gashed upon clots of sand and pebbles. And yet, as another wave broke, it tried to raise its claws again. And when it did, the gunslinger stepped on its head with his remaining boot. There was a sound like many small, dry twigs being broken. Thick fluid burst from beneath the heel of Roland's foot, boot, splashing in two directions. It looked black. The thing arched and wriggled in a frenzy. The gunslinger planted his boot harder. A wave came. The monstrosity's claws rose an inch, two inches, trembled, and then fell, twitching open and shut. The gunslinger removed his boot, the thing's serrated beak, which had separated two fingers and one toe from his living body, slowly opened and closed, one intentionally broken upon the sand, the other trembled meaninglessly. The gunslinger stamped down again and again. He kicked the rock aside with a grunt of effort and marched along the right side of the monstrosity's body, stamping methodically with his left boot, smashing its, cell, its shell, squeezing its pale guts out onto dark gray sand. <clears throat> it was dead, but he meant to have his way with it all the same. He had never in all his long, strange time been so fundamentally hurt and it had all been so unexpected. He kept on until he saw the tip of one of his own fingers in the dead thing's sour mash, saw the white dust beneath the nail from the Golgotha, where he and the man in black had held their long palaver, and then he looked aside and vomited. Gunslinger walked back from the water like a drunken man, holding his wounded hand against his shirt, looking back from time to time to make sure the thing wasn't still alive. Like some tenacious wasp, you swat again and again and still twitches, stunned but not dead. To make sure it wasn't with, wasn't following, asking its alien question in its deadly, despairing, despairing voice. Halfway down the shingle, he stood swaying, looking at the place where he had been, remembering he had fallen asleep apparently just below the high tide line. He, he grabbed his purse and his torn boot, and the moon's glabrous light, he saw other creatures of the same type, and in the caesura between one wave and the next, heard their questioning voices. The gunslinger retreated a step at a time, retreated until he reached the grassy edge of the shingle. Then he sat down and did all he knew to do. He sprinkled the stumps of fingers and toe with the last of his tobacco to stop the bleeding, sprinkled it thick in spite of new stinging. His missing great toe had joined the chorus. And then he only sat, sweating in the chill, wondering about infection wondering how he would make his way in this world with two fingers on his right hand gone. When it came to guns, both hands had been equal.
but in all other things his right hand ruled. Wondering if the thing had some poison in his bite which might already be working its way onto him, wondering if morning would ever come. Wow. So he's messed up. it for now if you guys liked it please like and subscribe it helps a lot and uh, I'll see you in the next one take care peace out